everybody yep you made it to tuesday uh-huh yes Quite sir. an impressive uh, thing you know you got through all the whole of monday mm. you got to tuesday very very good yep well jack mcland is here how's jack how are you doing i'm fantastic Mika. how are you fantastic too mm. no point in complaining no one wants to hear about it yeah right no one and cares. also like you think you've got problems and then you realize like actually i'm yeah. okay mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. it goes mm-hmm. anyway so Let's get cracking. We have a lot to do this morning and lots of uh, things to, to speak about, lots of people to discuss stuff with. Um, later on, we're going to be joined. I don't know anything about these people. <laughs> the organic humanity movement. So I don't know what they stand for or anything else. But, you know, as part of Democracy 101, we need to sometimes challenge ourselves to open our minds a little bit. Yeah, well hear what kinds of organizations and movements people are starting and why they're doing it and how many people support them. And, you know, that's kind of part of the fun. But, you know, truth be told, organic humanity movement. Sounds a bit like vegans. Yeah. It sounds like we're going to be (laughs) chanting that animals have the right to live. Uh, But we'll see. We'll see. uh, Let's see what happens. Organic humanity movement. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm. What a what a name! Let's see what they uh, have to say for themselves. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I've got a couple of questions already, and I actually my very first question is going to be: How did you come up with that name? Yeah, like which, it which does, like the minute you use the word organic, yeah, it's like I always get the idea of like some really dirty old like earthy person who yeah. you know communes with the tree spirits. Mm. And doesn't wash under her armpits. Yeah, and tells you that earwax is actually great for your ears or some shit. Yeah, like that. and that you should uh, you should eat grubs and yeah. beetles and mm. <laughs> get back in touch with Mother Earth. And, That's right. and it's like That's organic it. humanity movement. It's like yeah. how many cyborgs do you know walking around? Yeah, well, exactly. The humanity movement has been pretty organic up to now. Up so to now, I think we've had a, a, a pretty good grip on the organic part yeah. about it. But, well, yeah, you know. I think so. You would think so. Anyway. I'm open to being schooled. We'll find out. All right. So a uh, couple of news things that we wanted to look at this morning. Yes, sir. Uh, we, have ble- we have bled as a country over 1 trillion rand in foreign investment. Are you surprised? No. If you were a foreign investor, would you want to put your money where we are right now? No. Okay. Well, then. This is not going to, the rest of the story is not going to surprise you much either, but here it is. Foreign investment outflows from South Africa totaling 1 trillion in the last decade have raised concerns with investors redirecting funds to more stable markets. Uh, factors contributing to the exodus include eroded confidence in South Africa due to government crises, a lack of regulatory certainty, and challenges in effective execution. I just want to go through those three again, and you tell me who's to blame for those three. Because it's not the citizens of this country. No. It's not ordinary people who run their own businesses or work for a company or, you know, trying to put food on the table for their kids. None of these are our fault as the citizens of South Africa. You know, None go through them about. again. So first one, government crises. Well, it's, it's in, in the, the name. It's in yeah. the name. Yeah. Uh, a lack of re- <laughs> regulatory certainty. Who makes those regulations? Again, mm. you know. And then... <laughs> Challenges in effective execution. Who, who is the executive and what is their job in terms of execution? Well, it's all the things they haven't executed on. There you go. So now you know. I, I feel like they were just doubling down with the rest of them. They should have just said due to government crises. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's about it. The other ones were just rubbing salt in the wound. Well, you know what, what really irritates me about this is that we could, we could really use a trillion 
rand in foreign investment right now. I mean, there's so yes. many things that we could we could put that money to work doing. Mm -hmm. There's so many opportunities we could create for people. And people go, oh, you're foreign investment. Why are you so interested in foreign investment? Well, I'm not, except that the money isn't coming from anywhere else. And if you have a system where they're just the money's flowing out instead of in, mm -hmm. it makes the people inside that system poorer. Precisely. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. Seemingly, you might have to be because, uh, you know, common sense is not so common anymore. In fact, I feel like in this country, we need a department of common sense. That's what we need. I don't know. I really don't. I mean, it's it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, it, it's going to drive me uh, to drink and I don't want to drink this <laughs> early in the week. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, too, it's too early. It is, truly. Yeah. Um, all right. So what, what's on your mind? Because let's not start with the bad news. I mean, we've already kind of discussed the uh, the problem that we have here with this foreign investment. That's not all the news. What's uh, what's on your mind this morning? What, so, are you, um, what are you thinking about? One of my favorite creators on YouTube, uh, there's a young lady called Amala. And she does different kind of news stories. But the one that popped up recently is J.K. Rowling and uh, oh, Daniel Radcliffe right. and Emma Watson. Right? So... These people seemingly have diametrically, diametrically opposed views on what a man and a woman is. So oh. JK has, you know, drawn a line in the sand to say a woman is a female adult, right? Mm. And Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson, who play uh, Harry Potter and Hermione Granger from the Harry Potter series, don't see that the same way. And they've said it publicly that J.K. Rowling is actually insane. So, so how would they define a woman? Because I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed when people say, oh, no, you know, uh, you can't use that definition. It's too narrow. Well, like, but I mean, how, how else? I mean, it's fairly clear. Like we've, when a definition was established, when a word was created, woman, mm. uh, in the mists of time, in every language, there's an understanding of a woman being a female Human, human being, being. an yes. adult female human being, mm -hmm. okay, as opposed to a girl who is a young female human, human being. being. These people in Hollywood and in the left in America believe they can take a word that has an established meaning and just redefine, but they don't even redefine it. That if they, they don't, if they said to us, "All right, well, we've changed it now. It means uh, people who are adult female human beings," and Men who dress up as adult female human beings. At least but they don't say that. They don't. And from no. that point, we could actually have a conversation about it, right? We can, you can get some pushback because there's a definition to work with. Right. But if you watch the movie by Matt Walsh, What is a Woman? Mm -hmm. It becomes circular. So it's like, okay, so what is a woman? Right. A person that identifies right. as a woman. But as what? what is that? And it just keeps going around and around so, in a circle. It's madness. So then... If if they can't tell us what a woman is, but they're telling us what a woman isn't, isn't, yeah, then why are we bothering to listen to these two piddly actors? I don't want to hear from them. I don't want to hear from them either. I, I don't want Daniel Radcliffe's input on anything. I, I couldn't even remember his name the other day. I really couldn't. I mean, J.K. Rowling, isn't it ironic? Mm. The woman who wrote the book, how often does the person who writes the screenplay yep. end up being more well-known than the people in the story? It's like... Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien yeah. becoming bigger than Lord of the Rings. You somehow. could you could argue, yeah. I mean, listen, it's just bizarre that how many years after Harry Potter? It must be like twenty five years now. It's a like long that. time. It's been a long. I read that book when I was in like the very first one came out when I was in primary <laughs> school. Okay. And now it's uh, it's all about J.K. Rowling and what is a woman? You know, I want to know how how it is. I've brought this up before with with women and I don't get a satisfactory answer because women are always much more conciliatory than men. Yes, they are. And I'm not looking for a fight here, ladies. So just don't panic. All right. Why is it that Jack and I are talking about this, but most women are just like trying to be, what's the word? Uh, I think to compassionate, tolerant, or whatever. compassionate yeah. Yeah. to people who want to take away the very definite definition of what it is you are. If someone said to me, you're not a man, I said, well, what, what am I? But women are not doing this to these trans activists. No, they're not. I want to know why it's only J.K. Rowling and maybe a handful of other. Jermaine Greer has been quite outspoken about this. Mm. 
but they're not a lot of, they're not a ton of women who are standing up and saying this. It is mostly, apart from those two very prominent women that I've already mentioned, it's mostly men standing up for this mm -hmm. and saying, no, 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 you're, what you're doing is no different to blackface. Yeah. Except it's woman face. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, the champions of this movement are women. It's it's unbelievable to me. The, I saw this clip of some woman at, um, I think it was a Senate hearing or something, and she made the claim that uh, men can't beat Serena Williams in a tennis match. And in, like any person with half a brain would tell you that that's simply not true. Um, at the height of her career, she played against the 200th ranked man and both Serena and v Venus Williams lost to the same guy right. in the same day. Right. And yet there's the, the, these... But there's no difference between men and women. Again, it's, it's like the, this funny... Um, what does Gad Saad call it? I've, I've spoken to him a few times. He's a, he's a regular guest on the show, actually. And Gad says it's a mind virus that seems to take people yes. over. This desire to be compassionate mm -hmm. and to be tolerant and understanding and you know thoughtful and kind and caring... Um, actually ends up being pathological. Yeah. Because it makes people do and say things that are completely untrue and that do more damage than good. But because they're so desperate to look like they're good people, mm. the people who are at the head of this movement or who are supporting this movement, the allies, so to speak, yeah. end up doing more damage than good. Um, what, what, what worries me, to be honest with you, is that in the background of all of this madness, there's now terms like benign pedophile. It's like, okay, wait a minute. What, what are we talking What's about? What's that here? all about? So apparently there's people that are attracted to children, but just don't touch them. Oh my God. And what must we clap and congratulate them? Listen, now? one of these good days, they're going to tell us that it's another sexual orientation that we need to somehow live with. That's the thing that bothers me here. Because if we're not with, we are going to, uh, play around with definitions, all of a sudden, certain things are going to become permissible. And once that happens, it's going to become acceptable. And I do not want to live in that kind of life at all. Um, let's just go back quickly, if you don't mind, because you brought up uh, J.K. Rowling and these two actors. Yeah. And really, we should ignore actors just on the face of what they do. They pretend for a living. These are, yeah. not, these are not important people that we need to be spending our time thinking about, right? Um, what should happen here? I mean, apart from people ignoring Daniel Radcliffe and Emma, Tom, what is her name? Watson. Watson. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I Genuinely, outside of ignoring them, um, I think some of these people actually need to get bashed a bit. Like, what, well, not, mean, not like physically. physically no, 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 no. Like, you Inspired. know what I mean? We, li we live in 2024. When I say bashed, everyone knows that I'm talking about the, like the internet. Okay. We need to react to them in the same way they think they're entitled to react to us, right? Because yeah. you can't, you cannot go against biology. Gareth, if I called you on some random night and I told you that I had a miscarriage, would you take me seriously? No, I'd say you completely lost your mind. Thank you. Yeah. So what we, we need to just get over the stuff. I've got no problem with people feeling however they want to feel, but we cannot... But, okay overlook objective truths but it's also uh, come on guys do you, i know you don't believe that i know you don't believe see this is the other problem it's like people are expecting the rest of us to just pretend that they're not deranged it, like, it is i know insane. i know that emma watson and daniel radcliffe i know that they're intelligent enough to learn scripts mm. and say words that are maybe three or more syllables long I know they can do that. Mm. They're pretty good at acting. While it's a stupid profession, I, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say it, that. I maintain yeah. it's a stupid profession. <laughs> it's, it's not a serious profession that you need to take people. You don't need to listen to an actor's thoughts on anything but acting. Sure. But no, they're not so unintelligent that they can't observe things that are going on in the world and work out whether they're true or not. Mm -hmm. So I know what they're doing is they're lying to themselves they're lying to us mm -hmm. and they want us to go along with the lie. Yep. For some reason, maybe they're under pressure from people in Hollywood. They think they won't get any work ever again. 
quite probable that's what's going to happen, right? And yep. that's why they're doing this. Cool. But then wink and nod at the camera. Or, or if you have any principles at all, shut up. That's it. And don't say anything about J.K. Rowling because she's standing up for women. Mm -hmm. Or stand up and be counted. That's it. Stand for something. That is it. Otherwise, I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to hear from you as an ally of a of a tiny proportion of completely mentally ill people. Mm -hmm. That's I don't need to hear from you. Yep. We no one has time for that. By the way, if anyone thinks I'm being extremely mean and unkind and all the rest, you're welcome to think so. I'm I'm terribly sorry, but just like Jack, I'm not going along with people's bullshit here no, just man. to make them feel better. No. I'm, I'm my job on earth is certainly not to make people I don't know feel better about themselves. Mm -hmm. That's and, and if you want to be compassionate and pretend that that's your job, mm. you go ahead. Ask Cat Williams about self-esteem. He'll tell you what self-esteem is all about. It's esteem of your motherfucking self, okay? <laughs> is that what he says? That's what he says. <laughs> <I love laughs> it's got nothing guy. to do with anybody else, bro. All right. Ah. Uh, listen, uh, these actors should apologize to that woman. They owe their Thank entire you. career to her. Thank you. Uh, no one in the world would know either of these people. Mm -hmm. Not at the level that they that they currently uh, kind of the space that and, they occupy and, and now do yeah. their thing at. Without no one without. would know that they existed by comparison with J.K. Rowling if she hadn't written those books and they hadn't cast them in those roles. Very they true. owe her their careers. Yep. They should shut up and support this woman. They should say to her, you know what? God bless you. You've made us millionaires. That's it. You've made us extremely rich. Extremely famous. We don't famous. owe you our lives, but we at least owe you the loyalty of not throwing invective at you. Yep. How un unbelievably ungrateful yeah. these two are. Mm. All right. So um, now that uh, everybody knows that this uh, show is horrendously transphobic, because you know that's what we're going to be called. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Then uh, Yasin says, I'm over 40. I don't give a shit. Good, good yeah, for you, sir. Well, yes, but you know, the problem is the stuff does eventually start to affect you. Mm. Like it does get in your way. Now, I was watching all of this stuff that was happening online during uh, the Iranian drone at attack on Israel. And I, I, I read some of the news around that. And I was, you know, I, was, I didn't watch a lot of it because frankly, I'd rather, I'd rather just, there's pretty much any number of things I would do, including chores around the house mm -hmm. before I'd pay attention to what Iran is doing. But we have to pay attention to this, and I need to at least know how I might respond if World War Three was to break out. Yeah. Just, you know, what would I do? Who would be the people I would be worried about the most? Um, where would I, where would my sympathies lie? What could I personally do in this corner of the world to make myself a bit safer? Mm -hmm. All those kinds of things. Be, just be sensible and practical about it. And right. Probably it doesn't affect us and probably it won't. Mm. And you think that, but then you suddenly realize like there are actually people walking around who are so maniacally tuned into this stuff mm. that they would actually make it your problem. There could be a protest yep. on the road that you use to get to work, even here in South Africa. Mm -hmm. There could be some com completely deranged lunatic from whichever side who's going to go and blow themselves up or do something equally like destructive yeah. and stupid. Yep. You don't know. So you've got to think, hmm, I, I don't want to consider the possibility of World War III. I don't even want to think about Iran or Gaza or Israel at the moment. Maybe I'm just living my life. And mm. many people in this country feel that way. Yep. And then suddenly, like it gets into your life mm. because someone online even says to you, your opinions are so unacceptable, they'll come and kill you. you, you this happens every yeah, day on, on social media. It now, does. most of the time you just write that off as, you know, lunatic. Being an asshole, yeah. Just a, a very sad, deranged, stupid person mm -hmm. who's looking for attention. Mm -hmm. But every now and then you have to think to yourself, hmm, I might just want to do some due diligence here. Yeah. And make sure that I'm not, creating extra stress for the people who love me, for the people I love. Um, I just, I need to do some housekeeping. So you think these things won't affect you. And they think, you think it has nothing to do with me, yeah. whether JK Rowling is involved in a fight in Scotland about the hate speech laws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And actually it can affect us because at some point someone here 
is going to try the same shit. Yeah. And you're going to have to have a way of dealing with it. Mm. So I think we've got to we've got to be a little bit more attentive than we might have. Yeah, right now we're in boot camp. We're just yeah. stretching. And, and let's hope we don't get to that stage. The thing I is, mean. I I honestly believe this, Gareth. Like we've actually got real problems out here, which is why we don't have time to be quibbling about sexual orientation and all of that other stuff. Mm. We've actually got genuine situations that we have to deal yeah, with. Especially in South Africa, we've mm -hmm. got real, real problems. Yep. Right. So it, it's never going to, like, the moment South Africa starts having a conversation about gender ideology and all of that stuff, then I'll know, okay, we're in a better place. <laughs> because at yeah, that point in time, say, people first, have... First world problems, right? Yeah, there yeah. you go. Once the pe people have, in, like, ample enough time to start quibbling about these kind of things, then we'll know. We are in a better position as a country. It's just, I don't want to have nonsensical conversations. That's it. Michelle says, don't let these woke mofos annoy you. You're giving them power. It's not so much annoying. This is the reality we live in. And you can either choose to turn a blind eye and hide your head in the sand, mm. or you can talk about it. Because at some point, like I said just a second ago, it's going to touch your life in some way. In some shape or form, right? yep. Grant says, uh, gender dysphoria is a genuine psychological issue. That's where it should end. Don't go around empowering this for more than that. I hear you. I hear you. Mm. Um, Mapadima says, uh, I cannot argue with stupid. If you want to identify as a hockey stick, then be my guest. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's mm, another one. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, too many people identify as an empty ball bag. Yep, ball fetches. Humans have lost the plot, says Paul. Mm. Enraged for power, money, and to think that politicians are responsible for this shit. And what's this this whole thing about people being like? What is so great about being liked by everyone? Like, uh, I, it really doesn't yeah, do but, much for you. But I, 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 honestly, this I'd is much, what people live for. Come on, give me respect any day. People live for this. They can't. Do you know how many people just they cannot wake up in the morning without hoping and praying that complete strangers care about them? Ugh. This is their this is their raison d'être, right? Uh, their reason for existence. Uh, it's all about like, please, please, strangers, love me and pay attention to me. And and I'm afraid social media has brought on an enormous amount of psychological issues yeah. as a result of of exactly this. Yeah. Um. So I I don't know what to say besides that. But yeah, there's this the, there's this definite bizarre thing that human beings are like they, they need more than ever need mm. to be loved it's scary and i think it might be because they actually don't have that real love in their lives it is it is a very real possibility the, the weird thing is this right uh yeah. someone will post a picture of themselves online and they'll mm. get 10 likes and they're depressed but if they were to bump into 10 real human beings who said hey huh. you look great today yeah. that that takes on a very different feel doesn't yeah. it yeah. And that's what a like <laughs> is. It's like, it's a compliment. It's a virtual compliment. Hey, you look great. Yeah. Keep it moving. You get one like, you should be happy. It's enough. Like, why should we be trying to, uh, you know, comfort ourselves by the acceptance of strangers? It's strange. It's so weird to me, which is why I feel like human psychology is one of the most interesting things you could ever study in your life. Because... The, the wants and needs that we have are so interesting. I find them absolutely fascinating. Uh, Vyasin says, the more people try to be different, the more they separate themselves from society. Yeah, but I think mm. also society has reached a point, Jack's quite right, like in some parts of the world where they don't have real problems, so they manufacture problems yeah. so that they can think that they've got to struggle. Struggle Which envy. Which is actually so is. the reason why, when you think about it, you know, a lot of people are trying to search for this utopia. Mm. That's what happens when people have things too good. We look for things to break. If the system works too well, we'll find a place or, or something to break down. Like, Okay, hanging with Jay has a problem with you. He says, guys, no disrespect, but neither of you know enough to talk about this. Make, making comparisons to allowing pedophilia. Come on. All right. I didn't say it wasn't uh, a comparison. Yeah, but, but uh, tell him what you meant because I, I, this, this was not a, a, a thing I knew about. So Here's what on. I'm saying. Like, the moment you make these kind of um, outlandish theories permissible, 
there's going to be some sort of nasty uh, after effect. Mm. Now, in the States, as we speak right now, there are people who are called benign pedophiles. These are people who have an attraction to kids, but apparently don't act on that attraction. And soon enough, mark my words, if we keep going down this road, someone somewhere is going to make that a sexual orientation that is going to now be added to the LGBTQI+. plus. I think that's where it is now. Mm -hmm. You get what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're going to somehow slip that in and make us seem to think or at least believe that there's something natural or correct about being attracted to kids. No matter what type of wrapping you put on it, it's still a pile of shit. I don't care what you say. Attraction yeah. to children is wrong. Yeah. Calling it benign pedophilia does not help the case at all. So you're just you're just drawing uh, attention to the fact that there are people who are playing with words mm -hmm. and that that playing with words has consequences. It does. You call something benign pedophilia or you call it uh, transgender or whatever, it, it, you're, you're corrupting language. Is you that your, that's your problem. That and is what that problem. does is it leads people down dark paths into dark places. Yes, because okay. we are sitting out here pretending that words don't have meaning. Right. And they do. Right. Okay. I'm with you. Hey, I'm totally with you. I don't know if you saw there was that uh, the clip that's been doing the rounds of Julia Hartley Brewer on, on a UK talk show. And this woman comes on and says, hi, um, my pronouns are they, them or whatever. And she, oh, yes. she's like, she goes, no, we don't do that on this show. Sorry. Not interested. You're a, you're a female. Yeah. I'm calling you she, her. Mm -hmm. I, I, I obey the rules of grammar. Right. That's all. It's not looking simple. for a fight. She's not going to get into it. She's not like, oh, I hate you or I love you or I'm an ideologue or you're an ideologue or this is why you're wrong with her. She's like, no, no, no. I just, on this show, we just follow the rules of grammar because otherwise it. it's very confusing for people. When you start referring to a single person as a they, it's just confusing. It does. Right. And it also begs the question, why should I play a part in your self-image? Yeah. All right. Well, can we leave this? Okay. Yeah. Let's leave Let's it because I, I I do feel like we we coming we're almost talking about as much as the Americans are, and I don't think it's as big a deal in this country. There are certainly uh, people who are you know genuinely grappling with this, and I understand. And yep, you have my sympathies if you've got this going on. Yep, in your life, or if you feel that this is your story, you have my sympathies because it's hard. It's going to make life tougher for you. It really is. And I'm I'm not looking to. I'm certainly not going to go around making fun of, mocking, ridiculing, being nasty to people for no good reason. But I don't think that we should be just green lighting every abuse no. of language, grammar, and truth. Nope. nope. There we go. All right. Uh, grammar Nazis unite, says JP. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, there's that. There is that too. Um, I do want to get into this though because... We're going to get to African analysis with JJ Cornish just now, and we'll talk about a bunch of things that are going on, um, including Sudan, which is just, it carries on. You know, here we are, we're paying attention to Gaza and Ukraine, but Sudan has been going on for ages, and no, nobody cares. No one cares, yeah. Right? And it's madness. Probably the human death toll there is, is, is way worse. In all but, likelihood, but again, yeah. no one cares. So mm -hmm. we we got to talk about that at some point. I do also want to get to this other thing that was on your mind this morning that you wanted to talk about: why kids aren't growing up. So, so tell yes. me about, tell me about this because I often think that we've infantilized children. If you look at university students who are living in hostels or in accommodation on campus, they're getting their meals paid for. Mm. They're getting their studies paid for, their books paid for, yeah. by grants or by bursaries or, you know, basically. And these are people in their early 20s mm -hmm. who really should be standing on their own two feet. The government, by that point, yeah. the government and the parents and everyone else should not be paying for them. Mm. The last time, and I, I swear I'm not special. This is, this is the case for many people. In fact, many people do this much earlier than I did. The last time I took money off my parents was 18 years old. Mm. After that, it was done. Yeah. I have not taken, and you can ask, you phone them up, I'll give them your number, or you their number. <laughs> you can phone them up. I have not taken a cent off of them since then. And, and it's not because I don't 
know that they would support me if I were in real shit. They would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously, it's nice that I know that I could. But the fact that I haven't is just part of growing up. It is. There comes a point where you have to look after your parents, not the other way around. True. And that point, the earlier it is in your life, the likelier you are to be a success because you're growing up fast. Mm -hmm. I know people who lost their parents at a young age, maybe both parents. Um, certainly, we all know somebody who, who, who lost one. Mm. You know, and we live in a country where there's so many people who've been raised by their grandparents or whoever else. And I understand, like, life is hard. Yeah. But the fact that we've got people in their late 20s and even their early 30s who are living off of their parents or the state mm. is disgraceful. There's no other way to put it. Mm. You can, I cannot take you seriously. Yeah. And I will not hear your opinion on almost anything if you are still bumming off other people in your late 20s, early 30s. Early 20s, sure. You know, you may need a hand up. Maybe you come from a very poor community and your chance to make it at university is to get a NISFAS grant, yeah, yeah, yeah. a bursary, you've worked your backside off. So I'm willing to, to give you as long as your degree is. And let's say you've done your bachelor's degree and you want to do your master's. Okay, you, you should really probably pay for your master's yourself. But, sure. But okay, I'm willing. There is always room for negotiation. Here. Yes. I think if you get to your 30s, you're still living with your parents. You're still expecting them to pay for things for you. Mm. Or you're studying at university and you're expecting the state, the taxpayer, to shoulder the burden of you becoming a permanent academic. Mm. I think that's infantilizing. Yeah, it is. You're not, you're not interacting with the real world. Is this kind of where you're headed? It is. It is. So I came across this really um, dope tweet by a guy by the name Jason Helms. And he read mm. a book by Abigail Schreier. And it's called Why, uh, Why the Kids Aren't Growing Up. Bad Therapy, right? So he breaks it down in the following ways. He says, mm. um, the key takeaways. A constant attention on how kids are feeling or thinking is causing negative outcomes. Constantly okay. ruminating on your emotions and how you feel negatively impacts your mental health. If all you do is focus on your emotions, you are destined to be anxious and depressed. Right. Which is the world right. we're living in now, right? Further, he keeps on going. He says, trying to solve every problem for kids has caused a generation who can't do anything themselves. We... Gen X, are, uh, were told to suck it up or you'll live or, you know, rub some dirt on it at any point in time. Many of us came to the conclusion that this is bad parenting because our feelings were neglected and we vowed not to do this to our own children. But because of that, kids immediately over-dramatize everything that happens to them, making mountains out of molehills and thinking the world must revolve around their emotions and feelings. Mm -hmm. As if, you know, no one went through the same shit before them. Like, come on. Just like, like Bernie Mac says, quit crying, do some push-ups or something. Um, do you think it's Gen X bad parenting or? Mm, is... I think it's a little earlier than that. Okay, I think, yeah. I think yeah, my, I think it's my, 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 my I agree with you. parents age group. So people that are in the 60s and 70s right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's where it started. And then, um, he keeps on going. He says, you develop confidence. We're and... throwing a lot of blame around this morning. <laughs> yes, and, and they deserve it. Here we go. Right. You develop confidence and strong mental health by doing things, not by thinking or via therapy. You can't think your way through, uh, your way out of anxiety. You don't gain confidence by analysis of your thoughts or mental health issues. You gain confidence and eliminate anxiety by doing gradually more difficult tasks, yes. excelling at them, and realizing yes. you are a competent, capable person. Right. Now, I already see excuses piling up here. We've got Naked Goose who says, oh, well, let me just go and live under a bridge and be independent with my 6K a month salary. Okay, first of all, how old are you? Because if you're in your... <sighs> If you're in your uh, late 20s, early 30s, and you're still earning 6,000 Rand a month, then you must adjust your lifestyle to Accordingly. suit how much money you're making. Or you should be learning new skills and improving your, your ability in the workforce so that people pay you more. Well, why is this something that actually needs to be said? I think well, you would have thought this is common knowledge, right? Naked Goose's parents probably never told them this. 
Oh, they were too worried about how he felt. Okay, we'll yeah. keep it moving. Gray A says, blame boomers. Uh, Slippery Pickle says, 100 years ago, a teenager would have multiple jobs from supervising the new chimney sweep mm. for coal mining, uh, installing asbestos roofing. Children these days are too pampered. Way too pampered. No one should be installing asbestos roofing. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, no, I hear no. you. No. My daughter's 20-year-old boyfriend is nearly done with his drafting qualification. He cannot get a job anyway. He's been trying for months. Okay. I understand that it's also a tough market out there. Right now, yes. Part of the big issue that many young people have is that they cannot get a job. Mm -hmm. So then you must make a job. Make yourself use so you can't be, you can't practice your 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 qualification in drafting because there isn't enough demand in the market for it. Mm -hmm. Then you must do something else. You have to. I mean, no, like wh who is, who's raising people to think that the world is just waiting for them? The world's just standing there with open arms going, come, I know you've earned this when you haven't. Here's, I'm waiting for you. I want to make all your dreams come true. Parents have been lying to their kids. That's yeah, a problem. It, it, in a major way. Because at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, this life is difficult. And you're not going to make it through it being soft and coddled the entire time. It's not going to happen. Aaron says, uh, Aaron Blade Mambu says, uh, you grow by doing, not by mm. getting. Mm. Your life trajectory is directly proportional to the difficult things you do and overcome. Yes, sir. Aaron sounds like you need to start a church. Hey, uh, oh, amen. Agree Hallelujah. with that. Yep. Nikki says, a thousand percent agree. It's the idea that child needs to be happy all the time. Yep. The minute there is a sign of sadness, they're sent to a doctor until they have ADHD or some other psychological issue. Yeah. Like uh, people not being honest with their kids and saying life is hard. Yeah. Sanella says, we say it all the time on The Real Network, especially in a work environment or just anywhere in the real world. Your feelings don't matter. You're there to work. Just work. work. Why must we know your feelings? We, we, no one actually cares how you feel. Mike, here's the thing. If we were to um, get into a war for arguments, you brought it up just a few minutes mm. ago. Yeah. I, I wouldn't want to be surrounded by people who care too much about how they feel. We've got real shit to deal with. Like yeah. there'd be bombs everywhere. But do you but, think the war is going to stop just listen, because we're crying? I, I think there's a place. I don't want to be one of these, uh, like I'm some kind of hardcore guy who doesn't give a shit about feelings. We often talk about feelings on this show and there's a place for that. And good societies should. Yes. Good societies should make time and place for us to talk about feelings, for people to write poetry, for songs to be written, for but that's for, the area for for beauty and though. art and all of those things. There's a place for that. It's hugely there is. important. There is. And and I think that the feeling crew are getting a particular tongue lashing this morning because we're annoyed by the fact that there's overcompensation. It's it's, this, it's sure. such a major overcorrection. But I don't want anyone who whose trade is feelings to suddenly feel this morning that. They don't have a place. Yeah, mind you, right. at no point did I say therapy is bad. No, no. Or that you shouldn't do it, right? There's a time and a place for these things. It's all we're saying. And like, if I'm going to have a child who I am raising, comes mm -hmm. home and, and tells me, dad, I had a bad day for whatever reason. I'm not going to tell him, hey, man, just man up, man up. Stop being what, such what? a little asshole. We'll sit yeah. down and have a genuine right. chat about it. Right. If it turns out that my child was being a brat. I'm going to tell my child, stop being a brat, straighten up your act, and you'll be fine moving forward. Yeah. What's so hard about that? Yeah. No, fair enough. But, you know, there's the, the I think we're, we're, the tendencies jump to extremes. Yes, we do. And I don't think that's very helpful here. Not at all. Uh, little Johnny is the most important person. He's special. The world revolves around him. You know, mm. that's, that's why a lot of parents have raised their kids. Here's Aaron, who I think is fast becoming one of my favorite commentators this morning. If you have an internet connection and a laptop, you can make money. It's as simple as that. Real talk. And Gail Force says, quite rightly, I offered to work for free. That got me the job. Mm -hmm. Lots of people have done that. Same here. I did that too. Yep. Um, damn, throwing, away, <laughs> throwing around hard truths this morning, says Ricky. You best believe. You best believe. Um, if you have a drafting qualification, says Linda, advertise yourself and work for yourself to start. I did it for two years. One of my clients offered me a full-time job last year. You see, Gareth, this is, this is where uh, I start questioning people. Like, so you'll have a person who has less than you, mm -hmm. who's willing to put it in the work. Mm -hmm. 
And we must feel compassion for you just because mm. you don't have certain, like, like, what are we doing here? A couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the 350 grant, right? Mm -hmm. And I pointed yes. out, you, you said, hey man, it's a little bit too low. You can, and I was like, look, I've seen a couple of people. Well, I was saying it's too low because you can't live on that, but then sure. you shouldn't be living on You that, shouldn't be. Right? All I'm saying is there are some people who do receive that 350 rand and somehow can flip it and make more. Yes. For argument's sake, a 20 pack of cigarettes mm -hmm. is anywhere between 20 to 50 rand. Sure. Right? You sell each one at at least two rand. <laughs> yeah. We're talking no, money. I hear, you, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> James and I were having this conversation earlier on. In fact, last week, um, where we were talking about, you know, uh, the people that beg <laughs> at traffic intersections and that kind of thing. Yeah. If you come up to the window of my car and you're just asking for things, I'll be less inclined to give you things in comparison to the guy who's got a packet of those uh, guava juice thingies yeah. and maybe a pair, a couple of cigarettes on the other hand. Like I'd be willing to give that guy some money instead of just buying it from it. You get what I mean? Yeah. One of them is taking the initiative that they have and the other one is just uh, playing on your feelings. Yeah. So expecting that, something for nothing. You get what I mean? Yeah. That's problematic to me. It's very problematic. So I've got no issue with bumping into someone who, uh, like even the guys that juggle or dance with those crates and whatnot, I'll give those guys cash any day. They're able-bodied human beings who decided instead of just asking for a handout, they'd do something to get that money. Um, this is interesting. Anna Marie says, the harder the truth, the better the show. I'm loving it. I'm well, glad you are. We stumbled on this. This is Jack's thing. I, you know, he brought up all of this stuff. It has nothing to do <laughs> with me. I was ready to have a very kind, compassionate morning where we would talk about our feelings. Ooh. But uh, Jack Mutlante refused. He wants to argue. He wants to uh, upset people and tell hard truths. No, I'm, ju I'm just stop I, ruining people's day, Jack. Listen, if you if if me just talking is ruining your day, <laughs> you've got bigger problems than me. Trust, trust, and believe. All right. <clears throat> All right, let's get into some African analysis this morning because uh, just every uh, two weeks or so, we get to talk to JJ Cornish and we get to talk about things that are happening on our continent, which somehow just don't get the amount of news, interest and attention that they should. That, yeah. that conflicts much, much further away that probably have a lot less to do with our day-to-day -day lives get. Um, and we'll talk to him. It is, of course, brought to you by the Johannesburg Business School, which is what you need to check out if you want to find yourself useful and relevant on the continent. They've got some amazing, amazing courses, amazing lectures. I would suggest you follow the links on our website and you will go through to where they are. Find out all about the Johannesburg Business School. If you haven't thought of, maybe that's the way that you can uh, find yourself a very cool little corner of the economy mm. to exploit and to make use of uh, your knowledge and uh, and help other people along as well. Johannesburg Business School, go and check them out. JJ Cornish, how are you, sir? Bonjour, I'm immensely well, thank you. I'm very happy. It's a happy Tuesday morning to you. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Very kind of you to be so kind to me on a Tuesday morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, JJ, um, I wish I wish that we lived on a kinder planet, and I wish that you know everybody understood suffering in equal ways. But it doesn't seem that that's the case. It's an anniversary which nobody really is paying any attention to. You, however, are here to, to remind us the anniversary of the civil war in Sudan. It and was uh, yesterday, the fact, yes, yeah, this is uh, more costly in human suffering than either Gaza or the Ukraine. France is hosting a summit to move this up the misery agenda. But does anyone care, JJ? Well, you know, the, the, the UN called for $3 billion and 6% of that came in. There is donor fatigue at the United Nations. And, um, and a lot of countries say, yeah, yeah, the United Nations calling for money. Well, Emmanuel mm. Macron, the French president, took the initiative and he hosted the summit. And it was uh, Western powers, neighbors, people like that. And he says they have come up with $2.1 billion. That's fantastic. That will go to food, water, medicine, and urgent needs uh, for the, the 51 million uh, Sudanese. Uh, they have 10 million Sudanese who have been displaced. 
there are nine, uh, 25 billion, a million who have been uh, affected by the civil war between the army and the rapid support forces, which will go on because both sides, and I've said this before, think they can win. And while military forces think they can win, they're not interested in talking peace. 730,000 children near death from hunger, right on the brink of famine. So this is, uh, you know, it's the largest displacement crisis in the world. Uh, and, uh, you, you, you know, these the services are not getting through. Now, there's no timeline to the promises made at the summit in uh, Paris yesterday. They don't know. We don't know when that money will come in because people have pledged it, and the, you know they don't. They probably don't have it in budgets ready to go straight away. But we hope mm. it comes through very quickly. Uh, Sudan can't produce food. Uh, its uh, state services are broken down. The economy is in absolute has gone belly up, and uh, it, you know it. It, it really is uh, 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 the saddest. A humanitarian disaster on the planet. And remember that Darfur was just a couple of 20 years ago, Darfur was. And Darfur is, is being hit worse than, than the other regions of Sudan by this. You know, one one part of the uh, one side of the, of the war is fighting the RSF in Darfur. And then they're taking on people who have remained neutral. Those who are have supported the RSF within Darfur are being attacked by the army. So you know it's it's just a mishmash and a, and, a, and a, an awful story. Uh, but the, the fact but is, what, um, but millions on the brink of famine. You yes. know, JJ, didn't we have Angelina Jolie and George Clooney and all of those people going to Darfur <laughs> and putting on uh, scarves to protect themselves from the sun and the wind and sitting on their haunches next to starving people? holding their hands and pretending they were Jesus Christ or Mother Teresa or Princess Diana or some combination of the three. Uh, why have they all lost interest? Is it no longer a sexy cause? Because I see they're, well, all going, yeah. to, I see they're going to the Ukraine to shake hands with Vladimir Zelensky. Yes, uh, that seems to be the guy. You know, I have, a, I have a pair of Timberland boots, very beautifully made Timberland boots with a map of Darfur on saying, hands off Darfur. You know, Timberland yeah. got involved. I haven't right. seen the same for Sudan. I haven't seen the same for Ukraine. I haven't seen the same for uh, Gaza either. You know, uh, this is the donor fatigue I'm talking about. And people are saying, we, we, we can give to good causes, but really the best cause is our own people, and our own people are suffering. All right. Well, I don't think we're going to get anywhere by asking people to be equal about their care for various places. So let's just let's move on. Sad as that story is, human rights groups, uh, I have a feeling this might be sad as well, uh, led by Amnesty International, want to block the sale of Shell's assets in Nigeria until there are guarantees that people living there will be protected. So obviously, we know that Nigeria is a very oil rich country and the oil ordinarily should help the people of that country to uh, live better lives. You would think there would be beneficiation, which is the big word that they use when it comes to natural resources. We use it in this country too. Whether or not it happens is a whole different story. But how does it help to, I mean, to go after the companies? Is that just because the companies actually can be held to account because the governments can't? It's, it's you know, it's the standard idea of like, if we can't get the the real um, the the party that is to blame. If we can't get them to do the right thing, we'll just go for the next best thing and the party that's actually competent or is trying to do a job because there are commercial incentives. We'll go after them instead. Well, God bless Shell, but they are very, very liable for what has been happening there. And they, what they are selling, though, is the onshore interests there. The the, uh -huh. the the land in it. now and, and Nigeria is the largest producer of oil in Africa. In 20, 2008, there was this massive oil spill into the Ogoni region, uh, and and of mm. course the beneficiation you say and the benefits of of yeah. the oil are not spreading. So they are liable for for they paid in twenty fifteen they paid eighteen million dollars in, in compensation. In twenty twenty one they paid a hundred dollars, um, but they they suffering nigerians of course uh, are nigerians they, they they come up to the oil uh, pipelines cut into them and steal the oil 
there have been massive fires caused by this. Uh, they sabotage the oil the, the oil pipelines because they believe that they're not getting the, their share of the wealth of, of, of this natural resource. Well, uh, what, what mm. the uh, human rights groups are saying is that we need to have the know that the, the, the what is left is fully protected and the, for the people still living there. Do you remember the story of Ken Sarawiwa in 1995, an environmental activist in the Ogoni region, and he was charged with uh, uh, killing some tribal members who opposed him and was actually yep. executed by the, uh, the, the military dictatorship of uh, Sani Abacha. Uh, there right. was, in fact, Nelson Mandela got very involved in that case, and he's seen as a martyr in this cause. Now, Shell is not getting out of Nigeria. They're not that stupid. They, they, it's, a, it's a massive oil um, uh, money market for them. Mm -hmm. they, will, they will do uh, offshore uh, drilling in the, oil, in the Gulf of Guinea, and they'll keep up their gas uh, uh, production. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great uh, proponent of gas uh, because having been to that summit of the gas producers and gas exporters, Nigeria... Sure. Uh, particularly big one of those and and that seems to go uh, unnoticed in in parts of the world but not unnoticed by the multinationals who are making billions from it all right so i mean it's a way to hopefully bring some pressure to bear on the on the nigerian government but but let's agree that as as exploitative as shell may be they're doing what they say they will whereas the government is not doing what it says it will and the government are the ones who are responsible for the people not shell it isn't a country owned by shell well, they have to they have to uh, okay the deal that Shell has made with a consortium of five uh, countries. Some of them Nigerian, most of them Nigerian consortium called Renaissance, and it is to the government right. that the human rights groups have gone and said, "Don't okay this deal until we have absolute guarantees that they're going to clean up uh, what what the, they've what the mess that they still have left behind, and that there are guarantees." that the people living there, particularly the Agoni, are not going to suffer for generations to come because of what Shell has done. Yeah, I'm, uh, who's, who's making the money out of this besides Shell? Well, the, the consortia were hoped to make money. I don't think they've gone in for uh, charitable reasons. No, not for so, all reasons. Yes, no. They're, 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 you know, being the largest producer, it always, it, whenever something goes wrong, uh, Angola steps up and becomes the largest producer. And <laughs> Angola has problems of its own. But, uh, no. the, the, you know, the, the, the production out of Nigeria, the largest in Africa, very, very important. All right, JJ. And then finally, athletics authorities, it's not often that we get to talk about sport, but are probing allegations that three African athletic stars let a Chinese runner win Sunday's Beijing half marathon. In other words, yeah, the Chinese said, uh, we, we, what, we'll pay you to get out of the way. <laughs> well, they ran the race together. Uh, I, I used to run marathons and half marathons and ran a lot with a lot of other people. Bruce mm -hmm. Fordyce was never among them. You know, I don't know what he has against me. He always just <laughs> to shoot into the lead and leave me and many others behind. But uh, he, here we have the three, uh, uh, Rob Ketter, uh, and Willie Nangat uh, uh, of Kenya and Dejan Haile of Ethiopia running with He Jin, who won the Asian uh, Games gold medal in, in the marathon. Now, uh, they got there and they were seen to be pointing to the finish line and waving th uh, uh, He Jin through. And afterwards, yeah. when questioned about this, uh, Willie Nangat said, yes, I let him win because he's my friend. You know, we've run oh before God. and I let him win. He's my friend. Then later changed his story to say that he was a pacemaker. But if you are a pacemaker, your number indicates, you know, has the words pacemaker on it, meaning that, you you know, you have certain rules that you, you're, you're allowed to step aside or something like that. But, uh, you know, the, the, the whole uh, the Chinese media is saying that sportsmanship has been shamed. There has been much cheating in uh, marathons in China in 2018, uh, um, uh, the half marathon uh, in, in Shenzhen, uh, 258 runners cheated. They went and hid in the bushes, and <laughs> came running out when the runners came around for the second lap. And uh, in 2019, uh, in, in Shuzhan, uh, a woman marathoner was seen riding a bike 
the officials stopped her and said, get off that bike. But as soon as the officials went away, she got back on the bike and ran, ran on. So there's, there's a rather, rather a checkered uh, career or rather checkered reputation that uh, the uh, long distance running has in China, I'm afraid to say. All right. Well, at least we've got something to laugh about this morning too. Yeah. And it's not all bad news. And obviously, uh, you know, I, I, I would, I deign to say happy anniversary, but uh, you know, I'd like to say a whole lot of uh, more encouraging things to South Sudan and to Sudan. Um, all right, JJ, thank you so much. We'll chat to you in two weeks time. I think he's frozen. He's frozen. Yeah, hmm. he looks a little frozen. Well, unless he was, yeah, he froze out of just like sheer desperation <laughs> having to talk to us. <laughs> That's all. That is brought to you by the Johannesburg Business School and you can find out more about them by going along to them on the social media on their own website. You can find out all about their courses and a whole lot more. That's uh, the Johannesburg Business School. And thank you, JJ Cornish, mm. with African Analysis for this morning. Yep. So uh, loads of interesting things uh, being said in the comments here. Carl says, everything in China is fake, even the running. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You okay. can really get that very right, good. yeah. Very, very good. <laughs> uh, Shell brings hell. They want the pristine wild coast. What the uh, fuck have you ever seen this considered by Gweezy? Uh, Who's Gweezy? Uh, Gwede Mantashe. Oh. I'm okay. guessing, I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, that, that, I don't know if that's a nickname that's going to catch on, but there we are. I actually like it. All right. Like um, it. Ask JJ how much of our tax money is spent on the AU. Well, mm -hmm. whatever is spent too much. Yeah. Um, let's ask AI to come up with an action plan to fight poverty. Ooh, you know what AI will do if you tell it to fight poverty? Mm. Kill people. Yep. That, that is exactly what AI will right. say. Mm. Jack, you're amazing, says Juliana. Oh, wow. You're amazing for tuning in. Oh. Thank you, Juliana. Okay. There's a lot of love going on there between Jack and Juliana and the rest yeah, of us don't nice. care at all. Oh, yeah, um, it's fine. I remember when Nicolas Sarkozy helped Libyan civilians with their humanitarian situation. Don't think it really helped much. Yeah. Macron is going to spend some of that money on his pedo <laughs> teacher wife. Yeah. You know, people go straight into the rabbit hole, hey? <laughs> don't waste any time. Unbelievable. It's, it's, by the way, she is both her and the husband. They're suing uh, the people that broke the story. Are they? Yeah. They're they going are. after them? They're going after them. Time will tell. So they're going to court instead of just releasing a picture of this woman as a child. But, but don't they know that if you go to court, you are going to have to prove. Yep. So this will be embarrassing. Look. I don't doubt that she's a woman, but it's going to be embarrassing for her to have to prove that in a mm. court of law. Mm. You know, in France, interesting fact about their justice system. Yeah. You are guilty until proven innocent in France. Interesting. As opposed to, yeah. So the burden of proof lies uh, on uh, the defendant. Uh huh. Mm. Oh. I wonder how that works. Mm. Uh, it's not so much a burden of proof thing, but you are presumed guilty, guilty. until yeah. you're proven innocent. So I think there's still benefit of the doubt. Um, sure. You know, there's, there's, there's that what preponderance of evidence, mm -hmm. a reasonable man theory, um, beyond a reasonable doubt, all of that stuff. That, that all comes to play okay. in criminal trials. But in France, you're assumed if they arrest you yeah. for a crime mm -hmm. to be guilty until proven innocent. So you have to go to court and prove yourself innocent. That's very I just thought that would be a very useful aside. Mm. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Democracy 101. I'm going to be talking to the guys from, I need to check this again, the Organic Humanity, humanity Movement. Yes, sir. All right. Very good. We'll find out exactly what they are, what they do, what they stand for. And by the end of it, hopefully we will know a little bit more about them. All of that and more on the way. This week on the Auto Trader Podcast. Basically, the badge plays an audio signal. It's an audio, like a little speaker, but it plays an audio signal that chases kangaroos away. Grey kangaroos, red kangaroos. I didn't even know that there were different types of kangaroos. I thought a kangaroo was a kangaroo. But apparently they've been testing this on golf courses and stuff. Wow. And it chases the roos away. What's because, you know, if anybody, you know, most of the people out here live in South Africa, mm -hmm. you will have encountered some wildlife with the front end of your car. Oh, yeah. Catch us every Monday at 9 a.m. on YouTube and on autotrader.co.za.
right, this is the Gareth Cliff Show, and we are about to start Democracy 101. Jack Mutlante is here with me, and we are talking about all things to do with our elections that are coming up. We're also talking about democracy as a concept. We've mm-hmm. had all kinds of interesting discussions with people who've broken it down for us. At the IEC in here a couple of times that yep. have made me feel much better about the integrity of our election mm-hmm. going forward. Mm-hmm. We've had political parties. We've talked about what we should be worrying about as a country, what we should not. Yep. All kinds of things. And we're going to carry that on today. Um, I'm very happy to welcome to the show this morning both the leader of the party called the Organic Humanity Movement, and that is Lauren, Lauren Bernardo, who's on the line. Hey, Lauren, how are you? Hi, Gareth. I'm doing well. Hello to all the viewers and listeners. Nice and I'm so excited you. to talk about democracy. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, I hope. I hope so, too. I, I really don't know anything about you guys, so I'm excited to hear about it. But also in studio, we have um, one of your uh, compatriots, one of the, the other members, members of your party. party. Just hit the mute there for me. I got it. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, and that is... Um, Matthew Pinard, who is also from the Organic Humanity Movement. I didn't even know you guys had this many members. You're putting a huge amount of pressure on all the other parties, <laughs> yeah. you know. Uh, so Matthew and Lauren, both of you, welcome. So, okay, Lauren, I'm going to let you start off with this. Uh, tell me about OHM. I know that that is a unit of measuring electric- electrical resistance, the ohm, mm. but I didn't know anything else about it. So what is the Organic Humanity Movement? You start off and give us a little uh, introduction to OHM and what you guys stand for. Okay, well, I love that you mentioned the unit of resistance because that's exactly the inspiration for the name. We started, or should I say I started, I was involved in politics since 2014. I was unhappy with how politics works internally, so I quit the party that I was with, and I decided to start the game. Who were you with then, just out of interest? The Democratic Alliance. Okay. Mm. Yeah, in the Western Cape. And lots, so, of, lots, um, of people, lots of people quit the Democratic Alliance and the ANC. <laughs> in fact, the ANC and, and DA lose a lot of people to start up new parties. It's quite yeah. a fun game they play. All right. So then you, because, you're in the West, you started this? Yes. Yeah. Because we recognize, you know, people leave because we recognize how toxic the internal politics is. You can't move forward. You can't bring a vision to fruition with the amount of okay. internal toxic politics that takes place. So I quit. I started the Organic Humanity Movement. And uh, we registered in 2018 as a political party with the IC, nationally registered across the country. And it was just me all by my lonesome. And then I started approaching people. And we grew slowly but surely um, to the point where I think at the end of 2019, we had 89 members. And then at the by the time we hit the 2021 elections, we had over 900 members. We're now sitting at around 2,000 members. And one of the things I wanted to do was create an environment where normal, good, decent, upstanding citizens could get involved in politics without having to lick the backsides of party bosses. So we have a very different internal culture with the organic humanity movement. And what our main function is, is to actually get rid of party politics. And, you know, we've seen electoral reform take place Mm -hmm. in the constitutional court via the changes um, that took place recently. Uh, with the electoral act but we want to make those electoral changes at constitution level because within the first lines of a constitution it says we're a multi-party democracy and we believe that multi-party system is actually undemocratic and we're talking about democracy here, so i hope we can go into that in a little bit more detail sure i mean so far i don't dislike anything that you've said um do you want to add anything to that uh, matthew before we carry on go ahead no i'll purpose really comes down to a couple of things is that direct elections we want people to vote for individuals parties get in the way they there's they create a, an accountability buffer between the elected officials and the ordinary people so that's the first thing that needs to change and the second thing is we need to change what the role of the government is they do far too much in this country they try to solve problems and end up making things worse so let's put much stricter limits on right. what the government can and can't do i like this so far you guys are winning me over i'm i'm actually already impressed i really i was very worried i said to jack earlier uh oh he's going to be vegans or something yeah i, th- I thought you, know, we, you I guys like, were going to walk in here <laughs> With with cowbells and all types of high frequency <laughs> noises you know what i mean i was worried for a second yeah. All I right. love that. That's beautiful. Um, can I just, Gareth, just take a moment to address the name? 
Yeah, go yes, for it. Yes, please. <laughs> so I'm also looking at the comments here. So organic humanity movement, OHM came first, resistance. What I wanted was to create a resistance against the current regime because a regime it is indeed. And then I filled in the acronym later, Organic Humanity Movement. Firstly, because we don't lead natural lives. Our kids go to an industrial style school system. We end up being most of us, or a lot of us, corporate slaves or uh, slaves in some kind of industry for the rest of our lives, earning a pittance. And then I realized there's absolutely no humanity in society whatsoever. So that's where Organic Humanity Movement came from. But as we've seen, the fourth industrial revolution being implemented, not just in South Africa, but in the world, we actually see the beauty of the name coming to the fore. So we actually oppose the full implementation of the fourth industrial revolution as um, stated by the founder uh, of the book, Fourth Industrial Revolution, the, the writer. And uh, we are advocating for a completely different way of progressing. So the World um, Economic Forum, for instance, will say we have to implement the fourth industrial revolution to progress as a civilization. I'm saying there's another way and South Africa is going to be at the forefront of that. Yeah, I like you even more because who likes Klaus Schwab? I mean, who the hell would want to agree with him? <laughs> so, uh, okay, this is, getting, this is getting better and better for you guys so far. Yeah. Um, let's just be realistic, though, and, and either of you can answer these questions. Um, you, you are a small, small, small party. I mean, there are small parties and then there are you guys. It's like even if you've got these 2,000 members, which is great. And by the way, you deserve credit for having got to a point where you've got 2,000 people. Um, who've signed up, but are you looking to take over in a particular place? Are there certain constituencies where you actually have a chance of getting enough votes that you have a, an actual impact? Or is it really just standing up and uh, making this your clarion call for this election and seeing if you can build for the next one? So in terms of being a small party, uh, we look quite small because we don't have any big names as members we don't reach out to people that's already in politics that's mm. big business people and so as a result you don't get as much media attention sure but our yeah. ground game is pretty strong so we got a lot more going on behind the scenes than what you'll see in the media um and yeah it's in terms of this election when you start from the ground up when you don't break away from an existing organization with people that's got the name recognition it takes a while to build and we decided to go a more natural organic route rather than uh, try to convince billionaires and big companies to come on board and fund us we said we're going to make this a party that's about the people that isn't influenced by big money politics and so that takes a more time to build up and yeah, yeah we will take a while to get to a place where we can compete for winning the actual elections, but you've got to start somewhere. Uh, no, no, I, sure. I couldn't agree more. And I'm, I'm just, I'm pleased that you have, but uh, we've got to have some realistic chances of success. Yeah. Uh, Lauren, are there any places that you're particularly hopeful that you'll get a, a toehold in? Contrary to, I suppose, um, what some people would find more intuitive, we actually haven't focused on a specific area. So we have members in every single province we have candidates in every single province and we are growing like everywhere at the same time, which makes it slower. So if I went and poured all my energy into Cape Town, um, we could have a different result. We could have people sitting in council right now. But what we've done is actually looked at the broader spectrum. We've looked at the whole of South Africa. We've included everyone and we're slowly growing a little bit in the Limpopo, a little bit in the Northern Cape, a little bit uh, in the Free State. And our strongest strongholds are Gauteng and uh, Western Cape, specifically Cape Town. Um, mm -hmm. But we do put our efforts everywhere simultaneously. And in the 2021 elections, we got 7,000 votes and we had a budget of only 60,000 Rand to campaign with. So I'm very proud of amazing. our um, amazing. successes, amazing. considering you only contested in 50 municipalities. All right, so Mo Rabbit wants to know, let's start off with who is financing them. People are always suspicious. You said no billionaires, no massive donors, 60,000 Rand. Where did it come from? Yeah, it's all small. It comes small. From yeah, Go small ahead, grant donations, um, members donating 100 rand here, 200 rand there. Uh, yeah, there's no... Well, I mean, you only you only got to 60 grand, so let's not punish anybody yeah. for the 60,000 rand they managed to <laughs> fleece off of their, their small small group of supporters. I think yeah. that's, about, that's just about the most honest uh, political fundraising I've ever heard of in my life. Very okay. Um, I see a lot of people who are already, they've got your logo there it's olga it's felix huge groundswell is happening 
Uh, lots of people who are very, very excited about this. Um, Linda says, OHM will get my vote. Already. All right, so let's get to some specifics. Richard says, are you for or against gun control? He's a single issue voter. And are you willing to name your funders? Well, we've spoken about your funders. It's yeah. like ordinary people. Uh, gun control, is that an issue to you guys? I'd love to talk about that. But, uh, first, it's just still on the funding. No one in salary and uh, no one in OM gets a salary. Not even me. We are all doing this as volunteers. Most people in OM uh, work or have their own businesses. Matthew has his own business. Um, some of the most uh, hardcore what activists in the party what, uh, has. Uh, let, their me, own let me ask. Business. Let me ask Matthew about that. What do you do, Matthew? I, I had my own business. I oh. shut that at the beginning of the year to focus on the campaign. But I was just buying and selling furniture. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. And is this is this something that you are able to carry on doing without like uh, earning a salary from it? Uh, between uh, up until the election, definitely. Um, yeah, wow. if the election goes well, I'll be able to move full time into That's amazing. politics. Yeah. Um, oh, so do. if we get a couple of seats, we both Laura and I will be in parliament. So yeah. that allows and, us to and focus full time on this. You're the Gauteng leader. Yes. Okay. All right. So, Lauren, I mean, we talk about politicians on this show and we're like, well, you know, it would be nice if they worked for nothing. You guys actually are. Are, are you are you able to make a living and continue doing this? Or are you going to suddenly, as soon as the elections roll around, find yourself having to like scramble to get a job? I mean, we you know, we don't want we don't want anyone impoverished, but I like the idea that you're actually an active citizen who's going out there saying what you're doing, doing what you're saying. And, and not relying on the public purse in any way. I'm very privileged to be married, I have four children, and my husband provides. So I'm lucky to be, I'm lucky and privileged to be in this position that I can use my spare time. And I use a lot of my spare time for this cause. And I'm doing this for my children and for the future of this country because I see the urgency to make a change because no one else is offering a viable solution at all. I love it. Uh, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm um, giving you a chance. Here. A little earlier on, you <laughs> mentioned that you were part of uh, uh, the DA, if I'm not wrong. Uh, you mm -hmm. said that you guys had an issue with how the party was set up. How how different are the internal mechanisms of OM in comparison to other political parties? We mustn't forget to answer gun control. So I'm going to answer both. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, internally, yeah. There's, no, there's no elections internally. So I remain the leader. I came up with this idea. I invited people on board. We have a structure, but I remain the leader. There's no one that vies for a position to be like the provincial leader or whatever. Um, Matthew's part of the NEC, the National Executive uh, Council. And so he's a national leader as well as representing Karateng right now. And mm -hmm. so um, we will meet and we'll say, hey, well, this member, they have XYZ skills. Let's ask them if they are willing to be XYZ. We actually, um, the, the most important position in OM is to be an area activator. And unfortunately, it is extremely hard work. So it's very hard to find people who are willing and able to have the time to dedicate to being an area activator. So that's the, in a, in a normal party, this is how it works. You enter politics, you're unemployed and you enter politics. So you're an unemployable actually. And then you show loyalty to the party by working weekends, working evenings, working public holidays, going on their marches, handing out flyers, um, proving yourself, proving yourself to them. And then the nicer and more helpful you are to people higher up in the party, the stronger your chances are of getting a position. It has nothing to do with your integrity. It has nothing to do with your capability or skills or qualifications. It's about how loyal you are to the machinery. And um, I despise how internal politics works. You cannot um, bring anything good to the country when you have that awful, almost evil way of doing things behind the scenes. And that's how we different. No internal elections. I remain the leader because I'm driving this vision that I had. And then um, when it comes to oh, a lot of people, especially now in campaign season, are going to ask, be asking us policy. What's your policy on this? What's your policy on that? We don't have specific policies because we don't believe that in the multi-party system, we have a right to be um, making changes to policy because the system needs to change first. System change before policy change. So uh, what will happen is that... Um, at a specific time, when our support is such that we have enough, uh, we want to change the constitution to usher in this new democracy where everyone votes for their president, member of parliament, uh, who's going to be regionally based, mayor and councillor, directly. So no parties, no government funding to parties, no political parties will be recognised. Only independents will approach the IEC. 
and say we want to run for public or I want to run for public office, they'll have to pay a deposit, also have a signature requirement, then they run for public office. Then they get voted in directly by the people. Can you imagine voting for the president directly? And I can't wait for that time. Well, I mean, it's it, people like Musi Maimani have been touting that, and and uh, largely the work that he and Bosa did is what made it possible for independent candidates to run. So I think if anyone deserves a little bit of credit, let's give him that. Mm -hmm. uh, I like this. Uncle Roy says, married with four kids. I'm so deflated right now. He feels like a loser by comparison. <laughs> so, well done. Um, oh, no. Are you a socialist, says uh, Azalea. She wants to know, are you socialist? We are not socialists. We are not socialists. Yeah, Not at really, all. Um, go ahead, Matthew. We very much believe in a free market. Uh, part of that organic humanity is people should have their own uh, control of their own destinies. So you have the right to choose, uh, make all the choices in your life. It's only when choices become too big for the individual does it move up. So that means very much free market based. Uh, I also want to add to that. Go on. Uh, I want to add to that and just say that I, we believe that most of the time the answer to any question is less government when it comes to solutions. Uh, what's the solution to this? What's the solution to that? Usually um, people in government will use a problem as an excuse to latch on and get more control over the population. We believe in less government is always better. And um, back to the, the, the policy issue as well. We have six principles with which we do things in OM and which we believe that uh, future candidates in or future public representatives should make decisions with. I just want to go through them quickly. Um, all those six principles have to be present in a solution for that solution to be the right one. And th they're non-negotiables. Number one, and they're in an order for a reason, number one is individual liberty. That is always first and foremost. You cannot take individual liberty away from a human being. No yeah. government can do that. Even if that person is making stupid decisions, doing things that's that's maybe not in the best interest, a government cannot go and take over. And I can name many examples of how the government does that. Yeah, but what about, uh, then like, comes, what about criminal justice uh, as an idea? I mean, surely uh, the government has has a monopoly on violence so that it can police society and so that people can be put in jail if they break the laws. That is a limit on people's personal freedoms. No? 100%. 100%. I don't know if you want to, Matthew's quite passionate about this one. I don't know if Matthew wants to answer this, but this is 100% it. If you infringe on someone else's freedom uh, by taking away their life, stealing their stuff or whatever, mm -hmm. then absolutely the uh, arm of the law will definitely take effect. Yeah, it comes down to the non-aggression principle. You have the right to do whatever you want as long as you're not harming anyone else or infringing on their freedom to do the same. So as long as you stick to your end of the deal, you maintain your rights, your freedoms. As soon as you infringe on someone else's, that's when you lose those rights and freedoms. All right. Hmm. Uh, th so the other principle, as I interrupted you? Sorry, there's five. Uh, protection of life, especially in terms of governing, when government happens, it needs to happen from the perspective of actually protecting the most vulnerable in society. Leaving people okay. that can look after themselves alone and protecting those that are most vulnerable. Then comes um, respect for earth. And just an example is how um, sewage water is just pumped into uh, False Bay here in Cape Town. And the government, the local government has talked about how it's going to cost billions to actually put the proper filters in place so that cleaner water can enter the ocean, as an example. So respecting the earth. Then comes self-reliance. And this uh, speaks to some of the other things we were speaking about earlier. Even in the, we're going to rewrite the constitution, not just the part where we elect our leaders, but rewrite the constitution. And with self-reliance, we want to acknowledge in our new constitution of South Africa that the first level of government is actually self-governance. Then comes family government, then comes uh, community government, all of which are unofficial, but equally as responsible as the next two levels, which is local and national. And then after self-reliance is continuous progress. So, I mean, we don't want to just live in the dark ages. And even though we reject a lot of the fourth industrial revolution, we want to use and be at the forefront of developing the science and technology to take our nation forward. And then finally, national unity, and especially when it comes to a zero tolerance for racism of any shape and form. Those are our six principles. This is how we make decisions. This is how we lead our lives as own, and own members. And this is how we expect future public representatives. And I'm sure a lot will come from the own community um, in, in the future government, in the future system. And as such, we don't have policies, but with regards to gun control, 
because the first level of government is the individual and because we believe in freedom, we absolutely 100% believe in the rights that citizens can arm themselves to protect themselves. And um, that is something that the government currently shuns, SAPs. So if someone almost kills you, if you survive, fine. Now you must go report that at SAPs. We say, uh-uh, you have the right to defend yourself in any way, shape or means. Okay, so that, that then comes into gun ownership as well. Mm -hmm. All right. What about property? Because you mentioned you're free marketeers, so you're, you're capitalist then. Um, property rights are a big issue in South Africa. We have huge amounts of crime and theft and all the rest of it. But a lot of people are saying in South Africa that the most important thing we have is the ability to give people who have nothing that 350 rand social grant. Have you got any strong feelings on that and on property rights? Well, property, property rights are absolutely essential to a free market economy and to the progress of any nation um, so those are pretty important we also uh, one thing that needs to happen is those need to be strengthened a lot of people in this country own property but not by the law they've just lived on that land for a long time but don't have any title deed or anything like that that needs is something that needs to be fixed um what was the second part um the the grant grants okay we don't actually have grants because we need grants we need grants because we have them it's once you put in a system of welfare then people start to become reliant on it mm. so one of the biggest challenges that we're going to have in this country going forward is to help people to become self-reliant so that they don't need to rely on mm. grant system the grant systems anymore so there should definitely not be any new grants and the current grants will need to be phased out over time as we help people to well get on their own two feet and be able to provide for themselves because we have a government system and we've had various systems as long as we've existed as a country that has made it very difficult but matthew people. people love free stuff come on i mean like people love free stuff if you know but i have free, to agree with them on that i i know but i mean you're both idealistic because uh, there are a lot of people who would not like to work and would rather suffer struggle make their way with 350 rand from the rest of the taxpayers well, God bless them if they want to do that, but it's not going to happen in this country. Lauren, listen, you guys are, <laughs> Lauren and Matthew, rather, you guys are saying a couple of things that I yeah, completely agree with. Um, I just wanted to find out, like, as far as uh, foreign nationals are concerned, that has become a very uh, hot button issue in this country. A lot of people have uh, problems with the influx of illegal foreigners into the country. What would your plan be to... Uh, fix that issue or how would you go about solving it? Okay, we haven't developed specifics on that yet, but it's one of the key government's responsibilities is defense and defending our borders. And right now our borders are very uh, porous, mm -hmm. shall we say. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I think the last estimates I heard is something like a million Zimbabweans living here, both legally and illegally. Yeah, We need South Af the South African government's responsibility is to look after South Africans. So we need to defend those borders. We need to make sure we don't have so much illegal immigration. Um, people coming here from Zimbabwe, Malawi, the Congo, wherever, those countries are responsible for those citizens lifting them up. We need to have a strong border defense mm -hmm. so that we are in control. We know who's here, who's not here. And yeah, just to maintain that our national sovereignty is pretty important. All right. Um, let me get on to taxes because that's something that a lot of people care about. Um, are, are you guys, because you're so into liberty and, and, and not interfering with people's lives and having less government, does that mean that you would be a party that would be less of a tax burden for citizens? You would reduce VAT maybe because uh, for poor people that can be an ad added uh, hardship. Uh, for rich people and people who want to start businesses and people who want to keep more of the money that they've actually earned, would you be in favor of that? What's your policy when it comes to tax? Yeah, taxes should I, be um, possible. Let, yeah, let, let Lauren get this yeah. one. Yeah. Lauren? Yes. Um, so, uh, because just because uh, of liberty and we believe in limited government, naturally tax will get less. So, we haven't developed a tax policy as such. Um, mm -hmm. We're looking at either drastically lowering tax or maybe um, getting rid of VAT, for instance, as options. This is something that we're going to develop with other South Africans, other legislatures in national um, parliament. But we definitely have the principle of getting rid of a lot of tax 
so that people have more money to spend, boost the economy. I think that's the quickest way for any government to boost the economy is give more money in the hands of the people, not through grants, but through lowering uh, tax, for sure. So that's definitely something we look at. We've looked at a couple of radical options out there, for instance, as either getting rid of VAT completely or lowering tax to a crazy low degree. Because we believe that the government is wasting so much money because it's just getting bigger and bigger and people are being overcharged. We hear personal stories um, from people who work in government, for instance, that um, see the uh, tender process happening and seeing how much government is actually overcharged for things. For instance, for a house that should cost 100,000 Rand, the government actually pays 200,000 Rand, for instance, as an example. So yes, a lot less tax for everybody. <laughs> It's no, a, it's a, I think it's a hallmark of a free society. Hmm. All right, but you still have to pay for things, right? So roads and uh, the So defense. we have an interesting, <laughs> Gareth, sorry right. to interrupt you there, but yeah. uh, we have an interesting government structure. So it's not only the multi-party system we want to change to a direct election system, we actually want to change the government structure. And it's in our manifesto, which everyone can read on our um, website. National yeah. government will only have three main areas of responsibility. That is the national defense defense will include like border protection international relations military um intelligence for instance and then um infrastructure and resources which will include like mines and roads and um things like that and then the last one is obviously the justice system and you touched on that earlier there's still going to be a justice system there are still going to be laws laws are very important but laws shouldn't control normal people Law should provide consequences for people that uh, infringe on other people's rights. So that's the difference. We're not putting laws in place that are controlling normal law-abiding citizens. We're putting laws in place that give consequences to people that do bad things, do evil things, and commit crimes. Um, but then local government has the freedom to do the rest. So we're going to make up um, areas in which are currently there, a lot of them are currently there, we're going to create uh, 52 local governments, local government jurisdictions. These are going to form um, the local government level. It's called local government now already, so that doesn't change, but they're going to get a lot more autonomy and responsibility. So for instance, I think major metros can probably be divided uh, into two or up to four, depending on the size and population. Um, but local governments will do things like if if there's a requirement, for instance, in our Cape Town local government, if there's a requirement to look after the poor and the needy via a grant, it will be t the funds will be raised and distributed there. But remember, we're speaking of a democratic society. The first point of call is always the individual to solve a problem. When problems get bigger, we then we call upon society. So even uh, non-profit organizations, we believe, should not be funded by government. It should be crowdfunded by the people, because if people um, in those nonprofits are corrupt or whatever, they'll stop getting funding and they'll fall away eventually. So the best nonprofits will always be there, hopefully solving problems in society. When that fails, and when the private sector also can't uh, solve the problem. Only then will the people then have to petition government, okay, we need help. We need an old age home. We need SASA grants. We need whatever. And then people will be taxed accordingly, meaning that is completely, it is completely possible that in municipalities, as people prosper, because I believe the less government there is, the more room there is for people to prosper, as people prosper, they can actually become completely independent of their local governments. And then local government will just be there as like a little watchdog, uh, making sure that, that certain things are in place in the community. So that's that's our government structure model that we have. So I'm, I'm a person that's very big on checks and balances, right? Um, how would you guys go about well, if you are elected into um, government, what what kind of recourse would everyday people have if you guys don't deliver on some of the things that you're saying you would bring to fruition? Okay, in terms of checks and balances, the biggest thing that's in that area is the separation between the legislature and the executive in government. Mm. We currently don't have that. It's in, just in theory. But at the end of the day, the president is elected by parliament mm -hmm. who's put in place by the parties. Yeah. So if we change the way we elect our leaders, we elect the president directly and we elect our MPs directly. Now we have a real separation of powers and the president and the cabinet's now responsible for the government's administration and the parliament's responsible for legislature. So that's the biggest check and balance that we need at the moment. We also 
will create a system whereby you can remove elected leaders. Mm. So we can vote our leaders in, but then they rock up and they do something completely different to what they promised. Yeah. There's no way to pull them out. Like yeah, I mean, parliament can get rid of leaders, but the people can't. So there needs to be something that people can do, a petition or something where so many people sign, you can say, okay, we need to have a vote of no confidence, not by parliament, but by the people of South Africa as to whether that person should stay in office or not. Okay. No, because I mean, it's it's not like uh, politicians in this country have been particularly honest in the past 30 years. No. So I just wanted to find out if someone says one thing and does the other, um, yeah, do we have some recourse? We have to have some sort of recourse. And are you guys uh, going to do something about corruption? I mean, there's, uh, you know, everybody on, the, on their political party posters, this is what all the other parties are talking about. We're going to stamp out corruption. I don't know if I believe them or not, but they say that. I'd like to answer that, but I'd also just like to highlight, Gareth, that across the world, whoever claims to be a democracy, they're only at the very least, or should I say the very most, half a democracy. Because voting in a candidate is only halfway there. You have to be able to vote them out. And that's why, as Matthew said, we have incorporated a system by which you can vote someone out. And this is what's been missing in the modern world forever, in all democracies, the ability to vote out the candidates you vote in. Only then can you strive towards a better democracy when you have those, those checks and balances in place. So we're very excited about that. You can go read about it in our manifesto. But with regards to corruption, getting rid of the multi-party system will get, uh, get rid of corruption. I think corruption is actually a very weak word for what's taking place in government. Uh, it's not yeah. corruption. It's, it's blatant raping of the public intellect and resources. Uh, and the fact that we call it corruption, actually, uh, we don't do anything about it because it's corruption. When we call it for what it is, um, I think then people will start getting mad and start actually standing up and doing something about it. So I think the, the new government system we put in place will deal with that effectively. Nothing else will. You can't have the same, you can't have, uh, the same system with new people because the system itself lends itself towards being um, exploited by those in power. And that's the problem. My question then becomes, it's going to feel as if um, we're going to have to stop every five minutes because someone did something we'll wrong need and to then do, we have to We'll, we'll need to do a referendum every, every, every couple every, of minutes. <laughs> every two or three months, here we are again. Now Jack has to stop coming to work. Yeah. I have to go vote again because Lauren didn't pay the people she was supposed to pay. You understand what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, it's, it's not something that you can just do super easily. That's yeah, of the course. Thing. There needs to be a kind of threshold limit that you need to hit in order to bring about these votes of no confidence or whatever we're going to call them. But um, it, it means people will have to be involved. What are you going to yes. do, though, to get, I mean, we already can't get almost two thirds of our people to the polls yeah. at this stage as it is. There's like 27 million who are, are registered to vote this time. Who knows how many of those will pitch up? What I'm hoping is this election is going to be a threshold for that. So most people who don't vote, don't vote because they think it's not going to make a difference. Okay. And for since 94, it's not really made a difference. The ANC's had such a big majority that the le elections are not competitive. So after this election, I think people are going to start realizing that actually your vote does make a difference. The majority in parliament is actually up for grabs. An interesting stat is that if all the people who don't vote because they think it makes no difference got together, formed a party, and all voted for that party, yep. they'd win an outright majority. Yes. Yep. They wouldn't just beat the ANC, they'd beat the ANC and the DA and, and all everybody. the parties yeah, put yeah. together. Yep. So when you think, no, your vote doesn't make a difference, yes, it actually does if you are active and if you get involved and you JP participate. JP says, uh, Lauren, I'm loving the ideas. I hope you get the funding to campaign and gain popularity. Do you need funding? I mean, who doesn't in politics, right? What would you <laughs> who doesn't? We're fundraising as we speak. So we are fundraising in bits and pieces. We actually, um, earlier this year, um, actually last month, in between getting all those crazy signatures, and recently we raised 120,000 Rand and we bought posters, we bought gazebo packages. So a lot of our members will have the little tents and the tables and the tablecloths and the flags and all of that. Um, mm -hmm. And we pay for Facebook ads and things like that. So now we're raising another 180,000 Rand. We're already, um, we're already, ra of that 180, we've raised, raise 73,700 rand and that's going towards print media ads that's going towards more facebook ad, uh, facebook ads we've paid for our flyers uh we're probably going to print more posters we're going to get more gazebo packages we want to get 
about 35 in total. So we actually have people at voting stations on voting day. We're so excited about that. And so, yes, if you want to donate to O, you can just go to our website and go look at our um, bank details there. It's on the front page. Just scroll to the bottom where it says donate. Um, we have PayFast, and then you can just do a normal EFT. We only have one bank account. And if you're a member and when I talk to you on our Zoom meetings, I'm very transparent about what money's been spent on where. I'll even show you slips and invoices and all the rest as we go through that. Uh, but I just want to someone said something, and it ties into what Matthew said. Slippery Pickle says the problem with democracy is everyone gets to vote by Socrates. And I want to declare right here on uh, international YouTube that Socrates was wrong. He lived in a different time. Maybe people were more excited about democracy there uh, when he lived. But everyone can vote, but not everyone does vote. And the key to a thriving democracy is the participation of you, of everyone. Without that, we'll never have a democracy. So if you're sitting back at home and saying, you know what, I don't want to get involved in politics, um, whatever involvement that is, you are the problem. You will be the reason that we fall into a dictatorship time and time again. A democracy requires the activity of every citizen or we will fall into the hands of tyrants. It's that simple. And we have in OM what I'd like to call reluctant candidates. Um, a lot of the candidates, you know, they have jobs, they have lives. They had never dreamed of being in politics, but they see the need, they see the vision, and they've reluctantly become candidates. If they actually have to win a seat, it's going to turn their lives upside down. They're willing to let their lives be turned uh, upside down for the greater cause. But that's what we need. We need reluctant politicians in society, and we need active citizens, or we will always face the problems that we currently do. So from all indications, uh, we're going to find ourselves in some sort of coalition government straight after the elections, right? So yeah. all people that are far more educated on the subject than I am will tell you this, right? How how open are you guys to working with other parties? Yeah, because you've already because, you've, you've said you hate them, <laughs> right? Because structurally, you guys are coming from completely different uh, sides of the spectrum. Um, are you willing to actually have these kind of conversations in good faith, or Only is it not on the board at all? No, it's, it's very specific. So we are not going to go into co a coalition. I also saw someone ask, are we in the Moonshine Pact? No, we're not. Sorry, what? Moonshot Pact. We're moonshot, not in the Moonshot Pact. No, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. We're not part of that at all. We are not going to coalition with anyone. So when <laughs> our, part of our strategy is definitely to lobby other members of parliament to vote for the changing of the constitution. And because mm. of that, and I understand the challenges, um, because of that, I am hoping that new parties do come in because I do see the way the new parties are set up. And I'm thinking of one specifically, and I don't want to mention names. Um, they actually would benefit more from the change of the system than the current system right now. So we definitely, we're going to go the, what I like to call the Abraham Lincoln route when he abolished says, slavery. He had to go to the opposing side and he had to convince those um, members of parliament, whatever you call them in America, to vote for the abolishment of slavery. He had a massive task and he didn't think it was possible, but it happened. We're going that same route. Once we're in, that's why we need at least one seat. Once we have a foot on the door, we're going to start lobbying individuals, not parties, individuals with bums on seats in a national assembly. Listen, this is what we want to change to the Constitution. We believe we're going to get to a point in the country where the demand from the people is going to be so big that it's in your best interest to vote for this change. And then we're going to build upon that until the point where we can pass this new Constitution in South Africa that outlines the structure of government and the new electoral system. Okay. All right. So what kind of a president do you think you're going to be if you become president, Lauren? What, uh, what are you going to do in your first 100 days, as they, as they say in America? You know, your first 100 days, what are your policies? What are you going to make happen? What are your first priorities? Well, let me make it clear that's not happening in 2024. We're just hoping for a seat. Then we need to move to the point where we change the system. And then I'm going to be, I'm going to have to run for public office separately. Own won't exist. None of the parties will exist. And then I and maybe you, Gareth, and maybe um, everyone sitting here in this interview, will, all four of us will actually be part of that, part hey, of becoming please. candidates to run for uh, the presidential candidate. Um, I, I would. I absolutely am intending on putting myself forward in the new system. I would never do it within this system. Um, in the new system, absolutely be a candidate, a presidential candidate. But I'm also aware that there will be lots of other people coming to the fore. 
And I'm excited for that, to have actual robust debate and discussion in a proper campaign, in a proper democracy. I can just imagine and feel the excitement in the air when people are actually talking about issues, not worrying about offending each other and actually just having open debates in public. And, you know, the we need people to represent our values and morals and beliefs. And if you don't find a candidate that does that, then you need to stand for public office, even if it's at the level of president. But definitely uh, the things that we spoke about are things that I would absolutely uh, think about doing in 100 days, lowering tax, giving people a break so they can breathe. I mean, life's hard as it is. Do you know how hard it is? I mean, for a young man to start a family, to even think about providing for a, a future wife and to have future kids, it's just so daunting. Our system is emasculating. It is a heartbreak when you actually speak to people one-on-one. -on -one. The system is breaking people down terribly. So what I would want to do is just break down those barriers so that people can start living people can start thriving, not just surviving. Most of us live in survival mode in this country. It's not healthy and it's not why we came to this earth. I do believe that we came to this earth as humans to learn, to explore and also to enjoy life. And that is not happening for the majority, the absolute majority of South Africans. All and right, I, 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 missed a, I missed a little bit of this, but there's some very specific questions here and either of you can go ahead and answer this, Matthew or Lauren. Uh, number one, Richard says 50% permanent pay cut pledge if you get seats, would you do that? We can't uh, make specific promises on that, uh, but yeah, we'd like to rein in the spending um, of governments on salaries in general get rid of all those unnecessary ministries and things yeah, but, sure um, how about that vip yeah. protection yeah those bodyguards and yeah, no, for sure we spend way too much on everything in this country did you see the list last week by the way gareth like they, they, they've upped the spending in Gauteng is absolutely oh, yeah. ridiculous it is no, no. absolutely ridiculous. the mayor of joburg apparently needs six bodyguards which i, I mean, mean who even know? Would you know him if no. you saw him? The the tech mayor, the guy no. from uh, Al Jamal, whatever it is. No. I wouldn't know him if I nope. bumped into him tomorrow in the street. And who's anyway. trying to kill these people anyway? Anyway, look. Yeah. Um, right. that's, that's, yeah. Another another very specific question, or rather comment. I would have I would have them in Parliament, says Azalea, just to annoy all the old people. Can you imagine? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I will definitely take on that mantle of annoying the old people. I'd love to. <laughs> but, but that's true. We have to address the age in Parliament, the average age. These people don't have a future. Yeah. They have a retirement mm. to look forward to. They don't have a future to look forward to. Uh, yep. So that, that is a problem. The, the general age in, in Parliament, I think, is 65, which is when most people yeah. should retire. I mean, um, someone asked me, what's like, where do you see the country in, in 30 years? And I was thinking, in 30 years, I'm 66. I'm going to be retiring and um, probably having an absolute drill with my grandkids, I hope. So that means that the country should be definitely fixed by then. Absolutely. Otherwise, we've done something very, very wrong. I'd like to shift gears for a bit, right? Um, we, we live in a very, well, not even very. The, the world has a lot of countries. We are part of different international treaties, different agreements and all of this mm. stuff. What is your views on where South Africa sits in, as far as the international landscape is concerned? Oh, this is a fun one. So the international landscape. The international mm. landscape has done nothing but destroy South Africa. I said on Twitter the, uh, yesterday that all of us South African citizens are just extras in a movie. We're the background characters. The main characters are the US, the EU, and other international organizations that are absolutely doing everything to capitalize on South Africa's existence at the detriment of the people. We believe in international relations. We're going to have an international relations within uh, national government, but we want international relations on our terms. South Africa has absolutely everything it needs, not only to be sovereign, but to be a superpower, literally. Superpowers were built on the backs of the miners here in South Africa and on the resources here in South Africa. And now we want to turn that around. Uh, we'll be a benevolent superpower as a country. I, I believe we'll get to a point in the world where the world will look at us France, Italy, EU, I mean, like Europe and America who feel so advanced, Canada, will look at us and be like, wow, what have they done? Like, what's in their drinking water? How did they get this right? Well, they are crumbling due to, like, workness or whatever is going on overseas that's destroying the fabric of society. So um, we, we want to reject a lot of the policies that come from international organizations. For instance, a Belgian-based company is busy paying our government billions to roll out 
gender ideology training, not to students, but to teachers, so that in classrooms they can foster, uh, for instance, gender ideology instead of teaching it through the curriculum. So a Belgian company is coming to our Department of Education, giving them money to teach your child an ideology you might not even believe in. Unbelievable. Not even teach your child, child, teach your teacher to teach a child, but doing it this way, they actually circumnavigate yeah. the public participation process. It's absolutely disgusting. Also, go look at where UNESCO offices are based in Pretoria. It is at the Department of Basic Education. You can look at it at um, on Google Maps. It's absolutely disgusting how the government has allowed these crazy overseas companies to influence policy for the people of South Africa. We never uh, voted in Belgium. We never voted in any of those other European countries. We never voted in the WEF or the WHO. We have all the brains we need here in this country to make the tough decisions to take this country forward. We don't need the international community giving us money and telling us how to do things. So we reject that absolutely. If there are going to be any, any international relations within this new system that we're proposing, it will be on our terms only. But what would that mean getting involved in the AU, for example? I mean, we're part of Africa. Do you think the AU does anything useful at all? How about the UN? So well, that's interesting. The AU, I'm not sure what the, the purpose is currently. Um, I just believe South Africa can be leading the be the leading example of what we should be doing. I do believe that we can strengthen African ties to become a powerhouse of a continent, um, but it can't be done within the systems that have governed society. In, in fact, I believe them to be colonial systems that have governed society. We need a completely new way of doing things. And in terms of the United Nations, and UNESCO is an auxiliary of the United Nations, they've done nothing but try to control the population. Agenda 21, for instance, go look at our Nash, uh, government national development plan. Go look at Agenda 21 on the United Nations website. It's like a carbon copy. We are gonna throw those documents out and develop a new South African plan for South Africa. We're not gonna just bow down to the sustainable development goals. Uh, they all sound nice and lofty and vague, but every single one of the 17 goals is being used as a tool, as an excuse to control the population, the law abiding population, and to put more power in the hands of government and corporations and give the people less and less freedom slowly over time. So you don't even notice it going away. So we reject the UN's um, Agenda 21. We reject the Sustainable Development Goals. And they should technically, because they're a peacekeeping organization, should be completely fine with it. And if they're not, then they're hypocrites. All right. Uh, how, mm -hmm. about, how about international wars? Would we get involved in any of those? Ukraine, Israel, um, there's there's all kinds of talk now of Iran. Do you, do you, are these even important things to you? Or do you think we would be an inward-facing country rather than outward? Definitely yeah. an inward-facing country. Um, I definitely think it's important to focus on South Africa. You know, charity begins at home. And even with people that believe we should open our borders, for instance, like, I don't know, Julius Malema is very passionate. Africa is for Africans. And although I understand the sentiment, is he going to go build a school in Somalia? Is he going to go build roads in Nigeria? Is he going to use our taxpaying money and go build infrastructure all over Africa? I somehow don't think he will. I also think he likes capitalism too much. I don't think he's actually going to do that. So in, in that term, we have to look after ourselves. Do you know how much Cape Flats is a war zone? Why should we be worried about what other people are doing overseas? We should be worrying about what's taking place. Kids are being shot to death all the time. Most of the stories don't even uh, break the news. I spoke to um, a woman from Hanover Park. We are looking at her being a candidate in the local government elections as a woman who's coming from a very war-torn community. Just that week, nine people were shot. We have a war zone here in South Africa. I, I, I'm not even going to look at what's happening in the rest of the world until we have solved these problems here locally. All right. All right. I mean, that's a very, very straightforward answer. So far, you haven't yeah, exactly is. batted an eyelid and said, I haven't seen you thinking about whether or not something would be popular or not before you say what you think about it. Yeah. In yep. some circumstances, because I mean, we we've we've kind of been spoon fed uh, shit, and we've been told <laughs> that it's sugar for about thirty years. So <laughs> I'm I'm glad that you know we can 
actually have a genuine conversation about these things. You know what I mean? Well, I and, mean, uh, Vyasan says here in the comments, I must admit I was very judgmental before and I felt the same way, same but I'm here. quite impressed, especially because she's so passionate, made so much sense. Good luck. You know, I really did. I thought, oh God, you guys, because I've been like receiving WhatsApps from one of your people and I was like, oh God, let's just get these people on so they'll leave me alone. Okay, mm. But <laughs> I can see how passionate you guys are. And even though there are obviously lots of things here that many uh, career politicians will scoff at and say, are you insane? Uh, you can't let these uh, lunatics have the, the the machinery of power. But We've trusted the career politicians and it's done nothing for us. Absolutely nothing. And I don't see why we can't play with new ideas. I mean, I don't want us to break things that don't need breaking. And I don't think that that's what you're suggesting necessarily either. But there are lots of areas that we can improve stuff. What do you think of the of the education system as a whole? I mean, we, we always talk about education in South Africa being the way that so many people can uh, try to improve their lives, can try to build a future for themselves. Madiba himself said, uh, you know, education is the most important thing you can give to people. And then, you know, he said it's in your hands. But our education system is a disaster. How would you fix that? Because right yeah. now we've got a basic minister of education instead of Sorry, a yeah. minister, minister of, of basic yeah, yeah. education. You get what I mean? <laughs> All right. So, Matt, Matthew, you try this. Yeah, one. the education system is a massive problem. One of the the big problem with it is that we teach our kids how to be employees, how to do something if someone tells you to do it. Good slaves. Yeah, we don't teach critical thinking skills. We don't raise our kids in a way that they can go out and solve the problems that our country has. Um, we talk a lot in this country about jobs and creating jobs. Mm -hmm. We talk very little, little about creating entrepreneurs, about creating the type of people who can create jobs. We shouldn't be relying on the government and big corporations to do that. We need to give individuals the skills to be able to look after themselves to start their own businesses. Mm. So our, the way we educate our children needs to change. Ultimately, the government shouldn't be in charge of education. When the government's in charge of education, they use it to indoctrinate yeah. the new generation in their way of thinking. So that can't happen immediately because right now most south africans have to rely on the government for education so we need to move towards a point where we that can become independent where we don't have a uniform system because also different kids learn in different ways not everyone learns the same way but we teach them all the same way so that needs to change we need to have more competition we need to have different ways of educating uh, different types of learning for children and yeah at the end of the day it needs to be independence it needs to be competition and free market based and focus on critical thinking and problem solving skills to give I'd, children I'd like point. to interrupt there Matthew thank you Matthew but I'd like to just interrupt because I actually have four children and since uh, the pandemic happened I pulled them out of school and I homeschool them now um, mm -hmm. and the first thing I would want us to do in government uh, what I would do as a president for sure and I think next to the political system the most urgent change is the education system I would get rid of the curriculum. Dare I say, we'd even have a, a day where we can just throw out the textbooks because it's been influenced so much by UNESCO from 1994, from the time that the new government was brought into power, UNESCO, United Nations has been there interfering with our curriculum. So I believe that there will probably for a very, very long time, decades even, still be a need for public schooling. Uh, even though we want um, unconventional schooling to become more the norm, I do believe that it will be necessary. And, be, and because it will be necessary, I believe the mandate of um, public schooling should just be three things. Increase the child's IQ, increase the child's EQ, and then lastly, they need to leave school with a tangible, marketable skill of some kind. And right. if we do that, we'll set up the generation to solve the problems of the future. And that's just in summary. I mean, we can, I mean, because I have kids and because I've spoken to so many social workers and teachers and ex-teachers, um, I have realized that how we set up school is the problem mm -hmm. with society today. It's why we are so obedient. It's why we would rather have the current defective system than think about yeah. any new ideas because we think within the lines. We color within the lines. Uh, and we never think of the problem. Propaganda and brainwashing. No. I don't, I don't disagree with you the school system just strengthens the state. And Hitler said it when he said, uh, what, give me the youth and I have the nation? Well, our government is using that strategy right now. Our government's um, using Nazi strategy to stay in power. 
and it's disgusting. And so we need um, to create an education system that helps the individual child flourish through freedom, through playing in nature, through creative arts, focusing on sports, focusing on um, art, singing, dancing. And only when they get to a certain age, worry about the more tangible things and developing skills. So we're doing what school about, all wrong. That's the reason we're in the mess. We are. Um, I see yeah. someone here, uh, Beyond Politics, says Lauren was the founder of Leave Our Kids Alone that took on government and won. Um, tell us about that. Okay, in 2019, was it 20, end of 2019, um, November specifically, the government put a little article, little, little article in the paper, I actually saw it in an actual physical newspaper, about how they're going to introduce comprehensive sexuality education in the school curriculum. So there's already sex education in the school curriculum, but the, the international uh, bodyguards of this country was not happy with the level and depth at which our schools are teaching comprehensive sexuality education and so uh what i did is started a facebook group because my kids were in a public school at the time and i was like i thought i'd like just get a couple of moms together and we can oppose it at our school i started a group called leave our kids alone um within a month that had like a hundred thousand followers to this day it's still active we have 139 uh 134,000 followers and um we just Slowly but surely, we used to do awareness campaigns every Friday. The parents would wear white to represent the protection of the purity and innocence of children. Because in this curriculum, they were saying, like, at the beginning of every module, they had, like, these bullet points. And one of the bullet points was, like, you, as in a child who's reading this, have a right to decide um, when and who to have sex with. Uh, so I'm paraphrasing now, but it was uh, that was basically the gist of it. Good? Mm as a kid from the age of freaking nine are you serious and then they had very um uh, very illustrious case studies of sexual assault that a grade five had to read and i had a grade five and there's no ways i would allow them to read something like this and anyway the teachers thought they were doing this for the greater good of of humanity because kids have phones now uh, so you have to come with the times but actually what was happening is that the curriculum is giving kids ideas and causing more damage and even re-traumatizing children that have been abused. And so um, it all culminated, all our efforts culminated in about a thousand of us parents um, yeah. taking to the streets on the State of the Nation address, uh, the date of the, I think it was the 13th of February, 2020. And yeah. uh, we set a public declaration. So all of us in all the different municipalities we were in read out the same declaration. And then um, we just spread awareness for it. We had bikers joining us. We had uh, all kinds of citizens and groups joining us to pledge their support all over the country. If the bikers, Thousand of if us. The bikers, if the bikers are joining you, you're doing something right, yep. I suppose. Doing something right. Right. And anyway, Angie right. Mitzeka ended up saying it's no longer compulsory. Uh, she went from saying they're going to discipline teachers for not implementing these new SLPs to saying it's no longer compulsory. Teachers can choose if they want to incorporate it or not. It's still but not 100%. Yeah, go ahead. You kind of won. Kind of. Uh, I'd like I mean, to see it completely out of the system, but um, you know, yeah. The, the 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 amazing thing is, and honestly, I wish you guys all the best of luck. I really Same, think yeah. it's terrific what you're doing, and you know, power to you. If anybody stands against stupidity and bad ideas and uh, things like um, like interfering with like the innocence of children, I'm all for what you're doing. I think it's terrific. And uh, you've proven, you've, you've already proven you can make a difference. I wish you the best of luck. I hope you win. What the hell? Mm. Go for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank, Thank you so much, Darren. Thank, Thank you. Lauren. Okay. Thank you guys. There we go. That is uh, us for Democracy 101 today. We will see you on Thursday at 6 a.m. Cheers, everybody.